Uh, somebody asked me who I was going to root for in the game on Saturday, and I said, who the winner? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I am, I've been in Penn State since 1978, so, and my, my dad and my uncles and stuff are all Penn State grads, and I was the black sheep of the family when I went to Pitt, you know, so uh, I made it right uh, as, uh, as time, uh, time went on. Uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit about my journey um, as a student, uh, entrepreneur, et cetera, and, and some of the choices um, I made uh, in my life. Um, you know, you don't really become an entrepreneur, you know, at birth, so to speak. You know, um, you go through life and you say, what if? You know, what if I did this? And, you know, my grandfather was a farmer. And I saw what he did. I mean, he worked his tail off at Satter and, you know, bought equipment. And, you know, that, that, that to me is the hardest entrepreneur as a farmer uh, with all the expenses. And, I mean, you're, the weather is great. Crops, you know, you grow a lot of crops and the prices drop. You know, it's just a really hard uh, to be an entrepreneur. And my father was actually an ag guy. He was a county agent uh, at Penn St for, uh, for Penn State. And um, uh, uh, when he, w he moved to Westmoreland County, and started a landscape business, and he was also a teacher. And uh, so I worked in his landscape business, and I just saw such tremendous potential in that business, and he could really grow this thing and make a great, you know, a great business out of it. And uh, but he had his, uh, he had his pension, he had his medical, he had his, you know, his um, salary coming in. I mean, he just didn't want to take the risk of, of jumping out the window and and starting a business, you know. And I kept saying, Dad, you know, there's something the opportunity here. You know, you can do this, you can do that. And it wasn't going to happen. Um, it just wasn't going to happen at all. And, um, you, know, like, uh, you know, as I started thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, um, it was really by hearing other entrepreneurs speak and by reading articles about entrepreneurs that it kept piquing my interest uh, more and more. And, I mean, entrepreneurs can fail. I've known entrepreneurs that have lost everything and struggle and whatnot. But I was at the point in my life where I said, you know, I don't want to be 60 years old and look back and say, what if I would have done? I said, I'd rather lose everything I had in my life, okay, and start all over again than to get through life making excuses, saying, what if um, uh, I would have done it um, like that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a little bit of my, my um, transition, I guess, from, from graduating from school, being a chemist, working in a research lab uh, for a company called um, Sapelco uh, Corporation, and how I got uh, to where, where I am right now. That's um, I'm 60 years old, so that was, that was quite a while ago when, when I graduated. Seems like just yesterday, but it went um, really, really fast. So I started working uh, for this company, and I had, a, I had the best job in the entire world. I mean, I got to develop products uh, in a laboratory. The company was small, 125 employees. I got to write the literature. I, I went and spoke at conferences, presented papers, uh, uh, talked to customers. I mean, I loved my job, but back, back in those days, back in the... Uh, mid-70s, early 70s, the whole employee atmosphere was much, much different than what it is now. Uh, in fact, the manager, the, the owners of the company would pass this book out called Manager by Intimidation. Okay, L literally. I mean, and they would teach, their, 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 you're shaking your head, that's the way it was. I mean, that's what they knew. And uh, I remember one time, um, uh, well, the owner of the company hired a copy boy, like when copy machines first came out, to guard the doors. So if you wanted to make a copy, you had to hand them a copy, you know, uh, to be made. You weren't allowed to make copies. And you know what? If you ever copied a resume or they found a resume uh, lying around, you were fired. I mean, then it, so I loved my job, but I hated this work atmosphere. It just wasn't what I thought it was. And so I thought, well, uh, I'm well known, you know, developed a lot of products, made this company uh, a lot of money. And uh, I thought, well, I'll work for another competitor, you know, and went and interviewed and they didn't hire me. You know, I'm like, you know, they didn't hire me. It was the best thing that ever happened in my life because I really started thinking about starting my own company and, uh, and becoming an entrepreneur. So at age 30 with very thick glasses, um, scruffy beard, Hewlett Packard calculator. My wife said she'd never marry me if I look like that <laughs> when she met me. No <laughs> way, she said. But um, so uh, I, I jumped out the window. Um, and when I started this company, um, I had never taken a business class. Okay? I'd never taken an accounting class. Uh, I had never supervised anyone. You know, I didn't, didn't, you know, I mean, I was a group leader, but so what? You know, I could tell somebody what to do, but I really couldn't, you know, affect their salary or their career or whatnot uh, with it. I didn't have a lot of legal experience. I mean, I understood some contract law from, you know, dealing with vendors and stuff like that and reading them, but um, I was really, really uh, pretty green. And, um, uh, but I wrote a business plan, uh, you know, and spent a lot of time writing the business plan and really trying to get, get uh, everything uh, together um, uh, for this business. And in, in some ways, they say the reason Red Tech was so successful is because I didn't have all that training back then. 
And I, didn't, I wasn't polluted with all the stuff um, that uh, you weren't uh, supposed to do. Um, so um, started a company, uh, basically, back then, um, I, I was able to start a company on $90,000. Uh, and uh, I, I got a loan, which you couldn't get today uh, on my, my house, the equity in my house. I got a $50,000 loan. And I don't think there was 50000 there, but the banker cut me a break. And then uh, I got an SBA loan for 20000 Then I had to raise $20,000 in, in uh, capital. And um, it wasn't easy to do. I mean, people, you know, you talk to them about what you wanted to do, and, you know, they just you know, didn't quite understand what chromatography or what chemistry was or, or what I was doing. And, you know, the only people that gave me money were really, um, you know, my parents gave me a couple thousand dollars. That's all they had. My brother gave me a thousand dollars. You know, I, I uh, collected money from, from mostly friends um, out there um, uh, for this, um, this business. And, um, uh, so any, anyways, uh, you know, I'm, I'm collecting this money and I'm, I'm oh, I want to tell you a story. Uh, so I remember I met with a gentleman at State College uh, who was very well to do uh, at, a, at a big company. And um, I thought, well, he'll, he'll invest in me, you know. Uh, my wife knew him and, and you know, so there's a connection there. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, get an investment from him. And I'm looking for $5,000 back then, you know, or something which was relatively small compared to today's standards. And he heard my pitch and then he looked at me and he said, well, you know, what does your dad do? And I said, well, he's, you know, a teacher. And your mom, well, she, she stays home. You know, she's a part-time nurse, but stays home. And your wife's parents, and I uh, said, well, he works in a, a factory, PPG, and she's a telephone operator. At that point, he got up and he said, you'll never be successful because there's no money in your family. You know, no money in your family. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, you, I used some words that I shouldn't say on camera. <laughs> I'm going to show you, you know, uh, and um, I went on uh, to start the company uh, with it. Um, I was pretty scared uh, when I you know, walked into to the two owners of the, of the company, uh, Sepulco, and I actually told them what I was going to do. Uh, that I was going to quit and start a company. And the one was a PhD, uh, Walt, and uh, he said, well, things are going to be different at Sepulco. This is going to change, and that's going to change. And he's, he's telling me how things are going to be different. And uh, Nick is, was the, um, uh, the president. And um, he uh, waved his hand and Walt stopped talking. He said, well, Paul, he said, have you obtained financing? I said, yes. He said, do you have a place where you're going to start this company? I said, yes. And, um, and uh, he said, uh, 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 what's the third thing he asked me? Um, um, anyways, he, he asked me uh, three questions and uh, the answers were yes uh, each time. He said, well, obviously we're not going to you know, get you to change your mind on starting this company. He said, but let me give you three rules. He said, if you steal our technology, I'm going to come after you. You know, you got to develop your own technology, your own chemistry, not what we have here. If you steal our customers, I'm going to come after you. Find your own customers, just like we did, you know. And the third thing is that if you steal my customer, uh, uh, if you hook up with a competitor who's bankrolling you, he said, we're going to come after you. At that point, they threw me out the, the door and, um, uh, you know, I went into a very quiet stage of being by myself uh, in a room, uh, not knowing what to do first. Should I put together a piece of equipment, an oven, you know, plumbing? Should I write some marketing literature? Uh, you know, what should I do? I had it all detailed in the business plan, but it was really, really uh, stressful uh, when, when I uh, did that. So the original chemistry I had invented uh, sort of by reading professors' uh, uh, papers. Uh, and uh, so I started using this chemistry, and it didn't work. You know, I had wettability issues, and it wasn't until years later we figured out why this, why this didn't work uh, for this uh, professor. And um, so uh, I had to figure that out. I had all these columns on the wall. I was supposed to have... Uh, inventory by November and I'm burning through money and um, they're all on the wall they're not working uh, with it. I had some other devices that I had sort of designed from just sitting on sitting you know with my head uh, sitting on things and uh, and they weren't working um, but um, uh, I figured it out uh, you know I, mean, I went to the Petra catalog you know, you know the, the Petra company Gilles company nearby here yeah and I went through the catalog and and found this material that had the right phenyl vinyl you know, motives that I needed, and I mixed it in and, and, uh, and got it to work. Um, so I guess um, what, uh, what I want to say is if you're an entrepreneur, um, you have to really be good at solving problems and, and handling hurdles. Uh, I have a vision of life. Uh, my vision of life is that if you want to be successful, all right, you can't sit in the couch and work the remote. I mean, that doesn't get you anywhere. You have to get off your butt. You have to, you know, learn. You have to grow. Um, you have to be pushing yourself um, all the time. So the vision I have is that there's a racetrack of life and you're running around this racetrack. I mean, you have to. And, um, but there's hurdles thrown up in front of you. Okay? And 
you know, you may only have 10 hurdles in your life and I may have 100 hurdles in my life. And somebody will say, well, that's not fair. Well, you're right, life's not fair. Doesn't matter how many hurdles you have in life, the key to life is going over them, around them, through them, to where it becomes a pace. It's just another hurdle. It's just another problem that's thrown at you. Bring it on, okay? And you develop this, uh, this sort of rhythm as far as uh, uh, solving problems. Um, you know, and um, so uh, I, got, I have a lot of other problems I went through when I started the company, like they eventually did, they blacklisted me at printers when I very, very first started. I had an investor that put half the money in uh, who had a key polymer for me. Uh, and he backed out the last second. There were all sorts of hurdles I had, but, uh, but I figured it out. I want to stop and take, take some questions uh, and see if you have any questions for me. Um, right along. Yes? I agree with you that business schools often um, don't teach innovation and entrepreneurship. It was hmm? trying to change. Penn State is trying to change with the launch box, launch box initiative. But what advice can you give to business professors such as ourselves? And that was the challenge that I have well um, just to back up um, the business schools of the past are different than the business schools of today um, I completed my MBA in 2005 and I have to say that Penn State's program is very entrepreneurial very very well run um, there was only two professors I think that I made mad because <laughs> and and my advice really is that the best professors that I had were professors that worked in industry for a while and they came back to be a professor they knew what it was like out there. If they were a professor their entire life, you just don't understand what it's like to work in the business world and what you have to do. Um, so a mix of those, uh, a mix of professors um, that, uh, that do both. So, but um, you know, the thing the, from the MBA program, I mean, what they really taught you, which is what we used our whole life, is, is uh, uh, what gets measured gets improved, okay? And what gets rewarded gets repeated. And if you have those two mantras when you run a business, and you focus on those two mantras, um, you can't help but be successful. You know, because human beings like to be measured, you like to grow, something needs to get better somewhere. Careful what you measure. And then um, rewards, um, everyone likes to reward in different ways. Um, but the reward system is, is very critical to have a company grow uh, with it, so. Um, yes. In addition to the things related to your product, from starting a business, how did you deal with all the other things you had to deal with in starting a business? Right. Um, that's a that's a really really good question. So, I hired an attorney. I, I did a lot of the legal work and corporate work myself. I mean, I learned how to do it. Okay. And I had a, a brother-in-law that was an accountant, so he helped me uh, with some of the finances um, and whatnot. But I hired an attorney to look over some stuff. In particular, I had signed a non-compete or confidentiality agreement with with Sapelco, so I didn't want to get sued. Um, he knew I only had ninety thousand dollars to start this business, and he would call me up. He would invite me to lunch. You know, he would create a problem. You know, and he said, "Do you want me to research this for us?" I said, "Well, yeah." Okay, and he'd go out and research this problem. He'd come back. The day I started my business, he sent me a bill for five thousand dollars back then, and I didn't have five thousand dollars extra in the budget. I mean, I couldn't believe he did that. Here, I'm thinking it was all gratis. But the best thing I learned. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so glad that he sent me that bill because from that point on, anytime I work with a professional, I learned that I need you know, to have do not, do not exceed amounts up front, you know, what's, what's the engagement, et cetera. I wasn't afraid to ask after that. So that was one of the best, uh, best things um, I ever learned um, with that. Um, when I started um, the company way, way back then, there was a gentleman named Donnie Beaver who started a, a, a very successful company in State College uh, uh, area, actually Tyrone area that way. Uh, called New Pig Corp. Anybody know about New Pig Corp? So what New Pig Corp uh, did was uh, Penn State had some technology where uh, they found that if you take corn cobs and you grind them up, that they're very good absorbents for oil. And back then all the machine shops, et cetera, used to put the powder all over the place. It was a dirty mess, always sweeping it up, et cetera. And this company took uh, Penn State's technology, put it in, in socks. They called it pig socks. And they changed the entire machining industry. Um, they put these socks around the machines when the oil dripped, it went in and, and um, uh, worked and whatnot. So I says, you know, I said, Donnie, I said, you know, what advice would you give a young entrepreneur? And he said, well, just don't go to chemistry symposiums. He said, don't hang out with people like you. He said, go to the best business classes, the best thinkers you can, et cetera. He said, get out of town. 
Uh, and he said, because you're going to get busy, you're going to be caught up in day to day to day, and it's really important to get out. And I think that's something that really helped me is uh, uh, I got involved in a program early on called Birthing of Giants. Uh, it was done uh, through M MIT uh, Inc. Magazine, and you had to be 30 years old. You had to be under the age of 40 at the time, have a company worth a million dollars or more uh, to get into the program uh, to be entered. And um, they, they taught us culture through Ed Sheen. Ed Sheen, I don't know if you've, um, I don't know if there's, uh, maybe um, some of you uh, know some of the history back then. Um, Jack Stack, great game of business. Uh, he, uh, all the open book bu um, stuff was uh, being presented uh, back then. Um, John Cotter, um, who wrote a lot of book on change, leading change, whatnot. Uh, he, he was a professor and really, really taught us. In fact, uh, I remember something John Cotter said is, uh, you know, he, he said that Harvard had paid him a lot of money to figure out what entrepreneurs were going to be successful. Like, like, I want to invest in you because you're going to grow up and you're going to be Apple someday or you're going to be Rome, you know, phones or you're going to be some big company and Harvard fund is going to grow uh, tremendously. And he said, I put a lot of money into trying to figure out what a, a successful entrepreneur looks like. He said, and the end result is that when you first meet an entrepreneur, you're not 100% sure if they're going to be successful. He said they might have prior experience and they might have you know, the good technologies and unique in a lot of ways. He said, but the only thing that he found, and I'm going to write something on the board. He said that, um, here it is. He said, if you look at an entrepreneur, and here's, here's say two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 years. Okay, and if you look at ability, 50, 100, uh, zero. He said, we can score an entrepreneur. If, you've, if you, this is the second time you started a business and you failed, chances of you succeeding is much better, you know, because you've learned. If you've been in this industry for a while, if you're well-rounded, if you have marketing, plus you have finance, plus you have, you know, technology, uh, abilities, and whatnot, he said, I, I can rank you. He said, I might find somebody that's a 75 up here. He said, there's a good chance that guy's going to be successful. He said, but then I'll, I'll talk to him a couple years later, you know, and maybe they'll grow from a 75 to an 80, okay? All right, but uh, he said, and I'll use myself. When I started ResTech, I was probably like a minus 20. I mean, think about it, you know? I, no, um, I, you know, I, I didn't know what a balance sheet was back then. Um, you know, uh, I'd never supervised anyone. I mean, I was totally clueless, okay? But um, every year, I mean, I, I, I worked, I studied, I read, I went to conferences, et cetera. So he said, I'll meet somebody two years later. And I said, well, he's not an nincompoop anymore. He's still a plus 20 now, but he grew. He said, and then I'll meet that same guy six years later, and I'll say, wow, what happened to him? You know, he's, he's really changed. He said, and that's the mark of a successful entrepreneur or a successful student or anybody in their career is that it doesn't matter how dumb you were yesterday. It's how smart you're going to be 10 years from now. You got to keep pushing yourself, uh, pushing yourself to grow uh, over time. Um, so, um, but this, the birthing of giants was great. I'm still going back. They just had a, a class up there. Uh, you know, some of my classmates were very, very successful uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and they generated a lot of uh, a lot of revenue out there. Uh, the way I got into that was um, I had a marketing guy working for me, Neil, and um, uh, I was not big like in personal recognition of a company. You know, I, I um, this is my early years. I'm like. You know, I don't want to bother with this stuff. Like, I didn't write grants. I mean, I'm just, I did it all myself, you know. Uh, I spent more time doing than I did, you know, trying to get free money, uh, so to speak, uh, from areas. So Neil Mosesman came to me, and he said, well, Paul, he said, if you look at our numbers, he said, we've doubled our sales every year for, like, the last five years. He said, I looked at the Inc. 500, fastest growing companies in, in, um, uh, in the United States. He said, if we entered our numbers in Inc., we'd be number 13. I'm saying... And I said, so what, Neil? I said, if we're not number one, forget it. He walked away with his tail behind. I said, I don't want to spend all my time with an application, et cetera. He walked away with his tail between his legs. As a good marketer, he comes back about 10 minutes later. He goes, Paul, because I looked at the numbers again. He said, if we enter our, um, our numbers in Inc. Magazine, we're going to be number one in Pennsylvania. I'm like, OK, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> so we entered it. And that's how I sort of got into that program is, is um, we grew this company, ResTech. We grew it uh, from nothing, from one person in a room. Um, uh, we doubled every year for like seven years in a row. I mean, hiring, growing. I mean, I understand from a finance professor standpoint, I didn't understand like cash flow, how critical it was to keep it coming in. And thank, 
thank goodness we had a fast growth technology and, and uh, really good margins because that, uh, that kept us going. Otherwise, you can grow so fast that you can put yourself out of business. Uh, 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 but we, uh, we did pretty good. So we grew, in 20 years, we grew from one person or zero to over 50 million. And um, now the company is north of 85, um, uh, probably going to hit uh, close to 90 million uh, with it. So, um, but what I found as I grew the company is that my growth was directly related to the company's growth. If you look at where we, fl we flatten out and plateau, I had to have a growth spurt. I had to change uh, in some way because the guy with the beard and the thick glasses is not necessarily the guy to lead the company uh, as you get bigger. Um, it wasn't. Um, so uh, things I did early on was 360 reviews, you know, dangerous back then. But I, and I got some brutal, I mean, once employees realized that they could, you know, it was, it was a trusted system that I was not going to know what they, who said what about me. I mean, I learned more from 360 reviews than, than, um, than I did people being brutally honest with where I had to develop or whatnot. Um, I, um, I used to hire people that thought like me, you know, and, well, this is the way I think I'm successful. I'm going to hire managers like this. And then I uh, took a class uh, with profiling. I don't know if anyone's ever done the, the psychology majors here, the profiling, you know. So they did the, they did the um, um, uh, um, DISC, the ISC, and the, and the state nine properties, and they did all this different profiling. And actually, I was in a class with other CEOs, and there were very successful CEOs in there, and they all had different profiles. Okay? And then I took a class uh, out in um, Ohio um, that was a, a guy who was a spinoff of Doug Hall. Uh, he was a spinoff of Procter & Gamble for new product uh, innovation. And um, uh, he put us all together as various groups. And what I saw over and over again is the strength of a company is mixing dissimilar people that thought differently together and really respecting differences of opinion from you and just seeking them out uh, that was so critical to our, to our growth. In fact, I, I was a D driver, you know. I would like, take the hill, you know, let's go. But then I had Donna, who was a real high C, you know, conscientious calculating. She said, well, Paul, do you have a map? Well, no. So well, what if, do you have a flashlight? Because it might be dark by the time we go, well, no. How about some water? Well, good, good idea, you know. But I could create the vision of let's go, let's take the hill. And I'd surround myself with people that thought different, differently than I did. Um, and um, I really learned to listen to them and, and stop. Um, one time, um, uh, as the company grew, I hit a plateau. And I had a really key individual leave the company. Uh, and it sort of broke my heart. Um, I had a party for him and, you know, recognized him, gave him a plaque, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it really, I mean, he, this guy was, was, uh, was a key person. Enough. Like, I didn't think anybody would ever leave, you know, the company. And um, so I had a gentleman in from um, Oregon. Like, we went to the customer service uh, uh, magazine, uh, and this guy named Austin McGonigal, uh, who um, taught this uh, seminar called I, Inc., the best company ever worked for. And I called him up, the girl, the, uh, some of the girls went out uh, to see the presentation, said it was great. I called him up, see if he'd come to State College, and the first thing he says is, where in the hell is State College, you know? <laughs> what, you want me to fly there? And then he said to me, wait a minute, he said, is George Paterno still in State College? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm from Brooklyn. He said, I used to coach with George a long time ago. He said, if you can get me into, uh, in some, some way to see George without him knowing I'm there, he said, then I'll come. So he came, and um, uh, I got on there um, that way. So, he does this presentation, he gets everyone all riled up, all right? And then, he, then I go out to lunch with him, and um, he'd ask me a question, and I'd give him an answer, and I'd say, what do you think, Roger? And Roger would parrot what I'm going to say, what I said. And then he asked me another question, and, then, and I'd answer, and then I'd say, you know, what do you think, Mike? And Mike would parrot some of the stuff. I, and I could see this big Italian guy, I could see he was getting irritated, you know? Just, you know, I wasn't quite sure what I was saying, but he was not happy with me um, whatsoever. Now, I'm a scientist, I'm a geek, I'm an inventor, I love to invent things. I love to give my opinion. Yeah? That, that just fulfills me. If I have a great idea, it just made me feel good, you know, at the end of the day. And um, so we get back after this lunch. He pulls me in the office because you paid me because I'm never going to be here again. Uh, he said, you're screwing up. You're going to lose the company. He said, if you want to know somebody's opinion, ask, don't tell. He said, you have to become very good at asking questions and never letting anyone know what you think. Okay? And I wrote it right on my computer um, every day. I would go into meetings. Instead of offering my opinion on what I thought should be done, I'd ask people. And I became very skilled at like, asking questions. And what I learned is um, through that change, all right, people had better ideas than I did. But they wouldn't be brought up unless uh, I kept my mouth shut and asked and didn't tell. Uh, and then um, as an entrepreneur, I mean, 
you know, what gets rewarded um, gets repeated. If somebody comes up with an idea, and if you're leading that way, and they come up with an idea, and if it's their idea, if I can say that's your idea, great, you're going to leave and you're going to be so motivated to want to make that idea work uh, more, more, than, uh, more than anything. Um, uh, so, you know, it's like all these little lessons that you have that really help you grow as an entrepreneur, and that's that learning curve. But you have to be willing to, to uh, uh, you know, to grow and, and whatnot. Um, I mean, I, I took the team out to see Jim Collins twice, uh, went, and then we went to Colorado, Colorado Outbound. Uh, we did that, and all that kind of stuff. I think is really what helped the company grow, is not being afraid to experience uh, different things and, and different learning. Stop for questions, real quick. Okay. Sorry, good discussion. So, when you start with organization, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you move forward, you know, drive and all that, and then you start to grow, and pretty soon you're a mid-sized company. How would you? Oh, that's the classic question, isn't it? <laughs> How do you keep it going? Um, uh, I think it starts at the top, um, but as you grow, you have to have different ways um, to propagate the entrepreneur. Restex actually going through some of those um, issues now because they become very risk adverse. They're big enough. Uh, like as the entrepreneur becomes successful, you become risk adverse. You don't want to risk it all and lose it all in a bad decision or whatnot. Uh, so they're going through some of that um, right now. Um, um, I don't know if I have the answer to that other than it, it's, it starts by, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, uh, we, we uh, had developed a product whenever I was still the head coach at ResTech. Uh, we developed a product and um, it didn't have a good launch. It was basically a thermal conductivity cell leak detector. It was, you know, we made columns in chemistry. We didn't make little electronic gadgets, but we made this gadget because there was nothing on the market for it and it was, it was a great idea and we sold a lot of them. So we had a high failure rate uh, on them, you know, 10% of them, you know, uh, it's like a probe that you pull, pulls air through, it would suck in dust, something as bad as it just sucks in dust and gets plugged, or, or liquids, it would suck in liquids, you know, and go to the TC cell and mess it up, or battery problems, and, um, but we fixed it, you know, we got it right, so we're going to introduce another product, everyone's feeling, you know, very risk adverse, et cetera, and failure rates, and, you know, I stood in front of the company, and I says, look, I said, we've never done a flow meter before. This is really unique technology. Um, you know, we, we've done our homework. Everyone's worked hard to, to make this product as best as possible. I said, but the first year we introduce this, we're going to have a 20% failure rate. Everybody goes, oh. I said, but next year, we're going to have a 1% failure rate. In the third year, we're going to be Six Sigma. I said, you can't introduce a new product unless you're willing to fail. So uh, I think if you want to keep the entrepreneurial risk, you have to realize that failure is part of it. Not, all, not everything's going to be successful. Um, and some products we introduced were, were great sellers, and some were dogs. And you can't punish people uh, when they have an idea and it doesn't work. Um, so uh, I think that um, you know, to, to, uh, to keep entrepreneurial, you have to understand that risk is part of being an entrepreneur. And then plus, some of your scientists and some of your inventors are the wackiest people out there. I mean, they're, they're, they're just, they think different, you know? They're, um, you know, they walk differently. Uh, and you have to treat them a little bit like prima donnas in a way, you know? And because all they want to do is be recognized for their good ideas, you know? And um, so you have to learn how to work with different, different type of products. And then you've got the real regimented production kind, you know, that they, they only want everything to, to, to have a high pass rate and they want everything to be written out and every procedure to be exact, et cetera. And um, so there's all sorts of different personalities you're working, working with um, to make it work. So um, any more questions? Motivating a sales team. Um, yeah. Well, we, we had a saying: everyone's in sales. I don't care if you're an R and D. I don't care uh, if you're customer service. Everybody's in sales um, out there. Um, that's important. Um, um, I mean, we had, we had a great technical sales team, uh, and um, I mean, it, you, you spend time with them. You travel with them. Like we'd have the technical people travel with them. So they would get him into accounts and whatnot, and then uh, follow up. We'd have training uh, for them. Um, uh, I'm trying to think how you, it's, uh, motivating salespeople is a constant thing that you need to do. Money doesn't always work. I mean, money's a, a part of that. You know, if you meet your uh, goals and whatnot, that's a big part um, of it too as well. So we set up a lot of a lot of incentive programs they for territories. What's that? They tend, if, if uh, a lot of employees stay because they like the company and they're happy, 
uh, not only because they're just looking for more money. I mean, you lose, you lose some, as long as you pay people fairly. We had a philosophy that we paid people at market rates, um, though we had like a lot of benefits and, uh, you know, uh, that we provided for employees that really took it above. And made, like we have a fitness center, Restec just built a fitness center and it's, it's probably like a 8,000 square foot fitness center with all the latest equipment in, a big basketball court and stuff like that. Uh, it's even bigger than that. Um, uh, and then we have a lot of programs uh, for that because I, I believe that you can holler at the federal government uh, for, for not providing health care, you can holler at the, at the insurers and say you're charging too much, but really good health starts with yourself. You know, so we wanted, to, we wanted to create an atmosphere where employees worked out together, where spouses would come in and uh, whatnot, and a lot of programs like that. So there's, there was a lot of benefits we had um, to pull people together. But the leaders that you hired uh, to head your sales team really had a lot to do with what, what motivated them or what kept them there, what didn't, um, the people you choose. Um, you know, Jim Collin talks about, um, you know, the most important thing is to get the right players on the bus. And then as a team, you figure out where you're going. And I think as the company grew, um, getting the right players in the bus was really the hardest challenge you had. Um, like I believed in servant leadership uh, was, was my mantra. Uh, you know, I, I was very poor. You know, parents were, you know, um, pr um, pretty um, uh, modest means or whatnot. And I just, you know, always believed in servant leadership. Uh, you have all the boats rise uh, together uh, in a company um, like that. And uh, I think that was my hardest thing because I'd, I'd bring people in that wanted to boss people around or the management intimidation or, you know, this is, I worked at this big company, this is how I, I, I think things should be done. Um, I spent a lot of time getting alignment, working with people, getting ideas, et cetera. And once I got people aligned, we could go very fast. But you're going to take a lot of comments, shrapnel, people pulling you different directions until you answer all the, uh, the questions uh, and uh, move ahead. Uh, in fact, we did something. I did, I did a presentation uh, to, to a, a group of employees uh, for some uh, uh, product ideas and whatnot. And I had Neil, uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, Neil, uh, was one of the early partners. And um, he was my polar opposite. I mean, if I said something, I was positive, you know, vision, uh, raw, let's go. And he'd always give reasons why things wouldn't work. And I sat in a meeting one time and I, and I would say something about what we wanted to do. And Neil would speak up and he would say exactly the opposite. I'd literally watch the audience go like this, and then they'd wait for me. And then it was like ping pong, back and forth, you know? And it was very frustrating for people. And we read the book Hats, so we, we come up with this thing called White Hat, Black Hat. So anytime we detected a situation like that, I said, stop, White Hat, Black Hat, okay? And everybody in the room, we'd say, all right, let's get up on the board, and let's look at all the reasons why this won't work. Everybody has, everybody in the room has to provide reasons why it won't work. And then we say, okay, now everybody put their white hats on, here's the reasons why it would work. Everybody in the room. Even if you didn't think it was going to work, you had to have something positive to say. And we'd go around until it was exhausted on both sides. And then it was obvious to see, well, if it, you know, it might rain or it might not rain. I can't control the weather, but I can control these events. So you could identify the significant areas that, that uh, if you made those changes or addressed those issues, you could move forward and everybody would be aligned um, uh, you know, to really, really make. And what I found is that when everything was gotten out, uh, you know, out in the open, when everyone had a chance to speak, there, a lot of people are quiet. They don't, they don't want to offer their opinions, but when you have to offer your opinion because you're going in a circle, you know, they, they do. They offer their opinions, and everybody felt like they, they were part of it, uh, offered their opinions, uh, and that really made things go uh, very, very, very quickly. So, um, um, but this, you know, whenever, like I, I said, as Restec was growing, I mean, I always felt like I was inadequate, you know, like I wasn't quite the right guy to take the company to the next stage. So I hired really smart people. Like I hired one guy who had 1,600 employees working for him, he was Murata Erie, you know Murata Erie in, in town, um, so I've since been, been gone out of business. Uh, and I hired this guy that was the president of that because uh, he was retiring and he ran the manufacturing group. And I thought, well, George will probably take over the company, you know, because he's a lot smarter than me. He's got a lot more experience. And, uh, you know, the more I work with him, I took, you know, he trained me, he taught me a lot of stuff, but I realized, you know, I still had some things that he didn't not to run his company. So I would take a growth spurt. And then, um, uh, another guy uh, uh, was my president of ChemCut at the time, you know, and I brought him in when George left. And um, same thing, you know, he taught me some things. Like one of the things I did early on is, um, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was very passionate uh, about stuff. And uh, really, you know, my, my vision early on is if I could create a company where employees enjoy coming to work as much as going home, no one can beat us. And I kept saying, that's what I wanted to do. How I was going to do it, I had no clue. But I knew who I felt whenever I got out of college, 
and I first started inventing products and, and working, I mean, I was so on fire. I loved going to work every day. And then, managed by intimidation, it didn't take too long until I said, boy, I, I don't like this place anymore. I mean, I have to watch my back all the time. So I said, how can I keep that positive feeling uh, of people wanting to come um, to work um, as, uh, as much as going home? And um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I kept working on that and those kind of things to really make the company grow. So. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, it worked. So. Oh, uh, okay, so, so Ken taught me something. Uh, Ken Slocum, so I, I, uh, I lost my train of thought for a second. Uh, Ken taught me, um, you know, early on, if there was a problem in the area, I used to make it people, you know. Well, you know, Roger's the wrong person to lead that. You know, I've got to find something. It's Roger, okay. And um, there was a couple of um, lessons I learned. And um, Ken, Ken pulled me in, and he gave me, like, a mantra. And he, he gave me, he wrote something down. He said, Anytime you have a problem in the organization, it starts at the top. It starts with you. He said, look in the mirror. You, know, you had something to do with that problem. Okay? Before you point fingers, look in the mirror. Okay? So I would do that. He said, second, he said, the second level is systems, structures, process, procedures. He said, what worked when you had 200 people doesn't work when you have 300 people or 400 people. Or when your sales are this or what that. Things change on you slowly. I mean, I, I, you know, things are great, you know, sunshine's coming, you come in one day, it's like the sky's falling, you know, how can, how can everything fall so quickly I'm down there? So the second level of system structure procedures, it only is third, do you look at a person, do I have the wrong person in the, in the spot? But what people tend to do as human beings is we blame people. You know, you're screwing up or you're not qualified or you're not capable. And that, what that does is create an atmosphere of fear in a company. So top, it's always leadership. You look in the mirror, uh, figure things out. Um, you know, because you have something to do with it. If you ever think it's not you, you're, you're, you're completely missing the point. And then systems, structures, procedures, processes change. I mean, what you expected somebody to do may have changed, or maybe, they don't, maybe the expectations aren't clear. Uh, something got lost in the communication, uh, whatnot. Um, uh, it, can, it can change. So, um, and then third is person. You get the right player in the right bus. Sometimes you have to move around. I changed my title in 1997. This is right after Austin McGonagall was there. Because uh, I said, you know, what do I really do? Uh, okay, president, CEO, like I didn't need titles, you know, uh, you know, big deal. And uh, I really spent a lot of time just thinking, what am I, what do I really do? And uh, I thought with the head coach thing. Um, and I said, okay, the head coach puts the right players in the right positions, gives them tool, training, encouragement, so they can be a star player. All for the sake of creating a championship team which everybody wants to play for. So my role became to help everyone else become successful. In the entire company. I mean, I really worked hard, and, and sometimes what I would do is I'd help employees find other jobs. I mean, and if somebody grew in the company, you know, I'd help you. And, and they said, "Boy, that guy really cares about me," you know. And, and um, so, uh, in fact, I, I um, you know, I uh, went to see Graham. You know, in uh, the early years, I was doing stuff at the university, and. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't real happy with my title, head coach, and oh, head coach. <laughs> Made a little bit of fun of me at the time, but uh, I stuck with it. Uh, you know, a lot of people like, how can you be president CEO and go to head coach? You know, what, co what team do you coach? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but it, what it did was it framed me, and um, I, I became very good at, like, um, I changed. Like, when I started doing the personality profiles, I, I used to have an analytical profile because I was a chemist, and I changed to conceptual. You know, and, and Bartell, this guy said, how do you do that? I said, I had to do it, you know. Or I couldn't grow the company. I mean, I had to, had to physically uh, change. So uh, I would write things down on my computer that I wanted to become. And every day I would come in, I would look at that on my screen, okay, and say, this is where I want to be in six months. Uh, you know, this is where my, my brain uh, or my logic should be uh, in that. Um, but as the company grew, uh, I mean, I had to develop, like, core values, uh, uh, you know, uh, BHAGs. Uh, you know, you really have to, to develop the system so that you can align more and more uh, people um, as a company grows. Um, one, of, one of the other things I wanted to, I guess, get close to ending on is um, when you're a leader, uh, there's a book called Lincoln and Leadership by Phelps um, that wrote it. And one of the powers that Lincoln had was he was good at telling stories. Okay? I mean, that was really what made Lincoln very, very, he used to be a magician and, and different things. And he could tell a story about something that has nothing to do with me or you right now. But he'd tell this story and he'd bring it back to whatever the incident was, and somebody go, oh, I get it. Sort of like the parables in the Bible, you know? You bring it back. So I had to have a stage in my life as an entrepreneur when I came, became very good at telling stories. I knew what story to tell when to engage somebody, because if I said, you know, Roger, you really screwed up that one, 
it didn't work. But if I could tell a story and Roger would say, oh, I really screwed that one up, didn't I? You know, it worked. You know, if you get somebody, if somebody inside would say, I need to do something different next time, it worked. But if you told him, um, it just uh, just didn't work. Um, so anyway, so comp it was things were getting easy for me. Uh, uh, company was 50 million at the time. That was back in. Um, 2005, um, around there, uh, I was on boards, you know, all in public stuff, and I really felt like I wasn't giving it all my, my all at Restec. You know, I just wasn't giving them all. And one of the classes I took at Penn State was with Don Hambrick. I don't know if you know uh, Don. He, he teaches leadership management. Uh, and um, he had this uh, graph he gave in this, this one of his talks he gave. He talked about how, the, he talked about the lifetime of CEO. And he said when, a, when somebody starts in a company, they're full of you know, vinegar and and all the other good stuff, and they're, they're trying to make things happen, but, but um, employees don't really know if they're a good president or a bad president. They're not quite sure if they're going to follow them. The relationships aren't developed and whatnot. He said, but you have your biggest impact in your company at that time because everything is new. You're looking at it. You're, you're full of energy. After you're there for a public CEO, after you're there more than 10 years, you've developed all these relationships. You're predictable, et cetera. Your impact in the company is very low. So he looked at uh, particularly public companies, and he, he saw that you know you had to make a change for the public CEO every so often. And I, I, I saw his work, and I said, I feel this. You know, I, I really need to do something different because I just don't have the energy that I used to. And uh, I mean, I, I believe every leader should replace himself. You know, and I worked very hard to bring another, uh, promote somebody else to be the president. And um, I went back in the engineering lab uh, and developed a bunch of systems and had a great time until the company was sold uh, to the employees uh, in 2009. Um, my vision when I sold the, the company to the employees was that every employee should retire as a millionaire. That's what I said. And what we did was we matched uh, a stock, um, 401k ESOP stock. With if you put in 8% of your salary, I'll give you 8% of Red Tech stock. Okay. But if you put nothing in, I'm not giving you anything. That's how we, we did the uh, match with that. So when I sold the company to the employees, I think the stock was 220. It was split a bunch of times. And um, uh, so when, when you take a lot of debt on a stock dropped to $100, and of course employees were mad, well, Paul got more than we're stuck with only his $100, but it went to $100, that meant they were getting more shares. Uh, since 2009 till this year, this is back in, in April of uh, this year, for last year's value, the stock value is now 750 bucks. So from 100 to 750 bucks, uh, for, and I've had a bunch of employees say, Paul, I, I'm more than a million now, so quite happy. Yes? As part of the compensation, um, well, well, as an ESOP, they own the company. The only, there was some research that suggested that stock options were more promoting of risk-taking behavior than just stock. Yeah. I did, before it became 100% ESOP, uh, I did something called an incentive stock option uh, program. Um, I would give, say, a, a, an employee making uh, $80,000 a year, I would give them about 10% of their salary in ResTech stock over a period of five, well, uh, for five years, okay? And the IRS lets you say, okay, I'm going to allocate this chunk of stock so much per year for an employee, and, and you can fix the value so in time it grows. And then it becomes a golden hand, uh, handcuff too because if they leave, they lose it, um, different things like that. But that, that helped. But I, I, I don't, you know, I, I have to say that I don't think people really stick around or understood the value of the stock or understood any of that kind of stuff until, I mean, when, whenever ResTech was sold uh, uh, and became an ESOP, I mean, employees got checked for 220000 300000 and stuff. Then they realized it, but they had no clue until then. My parents, so my parents put in $2,000 um, when, when Restec was finally sold to ESOP, and they had sold some stock along the way, you know, you know buy a new truck. My dad, uh, you know, sold some stock. Um, he got over $1.2 million um, is what he had. Uh, so. <laughs> so, but there's a lot of entrepreneurs that start companies that aren't successful either. But if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be, realized, you have, you have to be willing to get the crap beat out of you. Okay? You have to be willing to make mistakes. You have to be willing to change. You really have to change. Um, you can't be the same guy with thick glasses and a beer and a calculator where you got one person in a room as when you got 350 people. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So good. So, all right. So maybe I'll end at that. I don't know. We're, are we getting about done in time? Or? Okay. I was stubborn. Um, I was very uh, idealistic, not realistic. Somebody would tell me something couldn't be done. I'd say, "Why? Well, that's the way it is." Oh, those were fighting words, you know. Uh, so I was just a very, very um, idealistic person. You know, I believe a thing should be a certain way. 
um, you, you know, you, you got to make it, uh, got to make it happen. Yeah, you're really going to make it happen. Um, okay, so I'll tell you another little story. So Res Tech's growing. Okay, we're we're finally making it. Uh, I mean, we went from 35,000 the first year, 185 the second year, half million the third year. We were on our way to do 1.2 million. Um, that was the fourth year of business. So when I started this company, Yola Packer, you ever hear of a company called Yola Packer? They became Agilent now, okay? They had a patent on the, the thing that I made, the, the polyimide coating on the outside of fused silica tubing. Now talk about risk. I mean, I knew the patentees well. I mean, I, you know, they were researchers. They swore in a Bible that Yola Packer would never enforce that patent. There were six other companies doing what I was doing, okay, not worrying about the patent. I said, am I gonna worry about that or am I gonna jump out the window? So our fourth year of business, um, I got a phone call uh, from them, from their corporate attorney. They said, guess what? We're enforcing the patent. And if you want to keep making these calms, you need to pay us a million dollar royalty, paid up. We don't want, you know, we want right, you know, right away, okay? So uh, talk about seeing your, your, eye, your life flash in front of your eyes, okay? So um, uh, I, um, I said I did the opposite thing that Rod Erickson did. I stretched out the negotiation for five years, okay? <laughs> Five years, okay, you know, letters, meetings, et cetera, until they finally put their fist down. During that five years, I learned how to use uh, chemical vapor deposition technology, um, uh, power, um, decomposition of silanes, uh, and I learned how to coat the inside of a tube and make it as inert as a fiber optic uh, tube uh, and get around their patent. I got around their patent uh, with that uh, back then. The interesting thing is that as time went on, I mean, the, the technology really grew. When they started working on bomb sniffers and bomb detectors and things like that, they came to us and, and we figured out how a way to do this star reaction um, uh, CVD uh, technology. And Yola Packer, the Agilent part, um, they, they, they bought that technology from us um, for years and years and years. And I got more than my money back uh, from uh, what it cost me uh, for, for that patent. And this is the second company that I've done is we had this little technology morsel that was all focused on on chromatography uh, and not just the world at large. And, um, you know, because way back then I had a hurdle, you know, a big hurdle, and I solved that hurdle. I have another opportunity in my second company, and I actually think I can grow Stoclotec probably 10 times as big as ResTech in half the time. Um, I think I can do that. So um, I have a lot of fun doing it. So. Can you take another question? Or you uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. You talked about fascinating. Uh, so you talked about. Uh, systems, processes, and so on. So you can just think about operations, excellence, mm -hmm. lean sigma. Uh, are you a believer? And yeah. Did you, uh, yeah. We took lean. We took six sigma. Um, Kanbans. I mean, y all, all the kind of stuff. So we, we study a lot of manufacturing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a believer. Yeah. Um, and we have, you know, and, and we actually train employees to get their black belt uh, and come in and lead projects uh, uh, to make things better. So, um, oh yeah, I'm a believer. So. and they're, they're thinking of becoming a budding entrepreneur and jumping into the arena, what piece of advice would you give to that person? What do they need the, to the, the, the best advice I ever got was I, I read it in a, in a book before I started my business, and it said um, uh, entrepreneurs that fail come back and they say, if I would have only spent my time before I spent my money. So all I can say is do your homework. Read. I mean, it took me two years to write a business plan before I started. It took me two years of, you know, I had a partner at one point, and he didn't, you know, I, I started realizing he didn't want it as bad as I did. Uh, you know, so it took me two years really to work on this. And, and when I started, I was so scared. And if I didn't have a business plan that said what I'm going to do today, next week, the month after that, if I didn't have a plan put together, I would have failed. Because uh, it's really scary when you, I, I was telling a young man, you know, I look at an entrepreneur as uh, you eat what you kill. I mean, there's no government bailouts, there's nothing. I mean, you eat what you kill. You're either successful or you go down the tubes. You know, you either make it, or the worst thing you can do actually as entrepreneurs be what's called the living dead, where you're working so hard and you're almost making it, putting lots of time in, but you're not quite making enough money to grow or do something, and all you're doing is working. It takes years and years and years, and you're thinking, I'm not, I'm just not figuring this out. That's, that's the, that's probably worse than failing, in my opinion, is being the living dead. Just being stuck and not being able to grow something or scale something you know, or learn with it. So, but, um, but I, had, I, had a, I had a great time. I mean, I had lots of rainy days, you know, and lots of problems to overcome, but it was, it was fantastic, uh, uh, you know. Um, and my biggest reward is I look outside, I see all the cars in the parking lot. You know, 350 people, uh, you know, putting their kids through school, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's, that's what it's all about. 
go back to Pitt? I don't go back to Pitt at all. No, I, I completely, when I went to Penn State in 78, moved up there, I mean, I had relationships, and then I just sort of got, I got, Penn State just infected me. Um, um, they've asked me for money a lot, but I, <laughs> I've given a lot of money to Penn State. Um, in fact, we did, we, my wife and I, our, our picture, family pictures on the Pagula Ice Arena, we, with Terry Pagula, we gave a chunk of money. He's a chemical engineer, you know. You know, hear the Terry Pagola story? You know it? Does everybody know it? So here's this guy who's a chemical engineer, Trump, petrochemical engineer, worked, at, worked in oil fields. Uh, he worked in oil fields, uh, uh, learned, you know, learned how to drill for oil and all this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and um, then um, uh, he wanted to start his own company and become a wildcatter. So what he did, I don't know how he raised the money, but he raised $31 million and um, uh, bought a big chunk of land in northern Pennsylvania and he's, his, his uh, business plan was to go get the oil that no one wanted and try to sell that. And he was struggling. He almost went bankrupt, and he had to take a partner on. So this partner, this venture capitalist, I think, gave him money, and they owned 40% of his company. I think he owned 60, and they owned 40% of his company. And right after he did that, he's almost bankrupt, they discovered the Utica and the Marcella Shale. Okay? That $30 million company was sold for $4.2 billion, I think? $4.2 billion. So... I, that's probably more getting lucky than anything, but he took the risk, you know, but he took the risk. He took the risk, and uh, he's given a lot back to Penn State. He really has. Uh, uh.